All right. We're going to have a great time in the Lord. Last night at 940, we said goodbye to uh, Glenn Smith. And uh, we, uh, we fought. Glenn fought very powerfully. He fought lawfully in the word. And I want every one of you to know that I'm disappointed that my will wasn't done. And uh, a number of years ago when, when we said goodbye to a very dear friend, Pastor John Gomez, something came to my mind way back then that I've never forgotten, and that is that Johnny, when he said goodbye to us, he had left in full strength, f- full of faith, the last photo of Pastor John was him with his, his you know, flip-flops and his cutoffs in the Bible, big old smile. And, uh, and I remember as I grieved over saying goodbye to John, I was like, darn you, John. When you worked here on staff, you always left with the lights on and you've done it once again. You left this here and you, you're no longer at risk. You died in faith. You you conquered. And two, two days or three days before Glenn left this world, he was telling the doctor, he said, no, I don't want hospice. I'm believing for the Lord to raise me up. So I want to just deal with this, that if you want a slick answer from me, you won't be getting it. But I welcome anybody that wants to talk with me because about a week ago, I felt a yes in the spirit. And when I laid my hands on Glenn and he had passed and been gone for maybe a half hour or 45 minutes, as I laid my hands on him, I still heard the Holy Spirit saying yes. And it told me that what he was saying yes to possibly from the first time I heard it was, yes, it's all well. I thought, yes, he's gonna not pass from this life. So, what I intend to do is to continue to do what Glenn and I and Pastor John and so many of us, and that is to lay hands on the sick. There's a pastor that lives a few doors down from the Smiths, and he'd been hanging over with Glenn, and they had discovered cancer growing under his armpit, and he was divinely healed. Alan and Connie come to church here, and Alan, when, when Glenn was on an upswing and was preaching healing, he lays hands on Alan, and Alan told me a few days ago, he said, I went to the doctor, the doctor said, I have the cleanest blood. So if you try to wrap your mind around why, why, Lord, did you do this, why did you not do that, I've just been here long enough to know this, we walk by faith, not by sight. And, and I was speaking with Jeremy on the phone from, from Alaska. I said, your dad left here like a stud. That's right. yeah. He was swinging for the fence. The cat's out of the bag. He's an author. He, you know, there was about eight plus leaders from our church all there. Just loving on Glenn and loving on Mary and the family. And what a, what a legacy. What a legacy to know that your dad died in faith and who Glenn is, is infused. Every one of his children serving the Lord. His married children have godly mates who also serve the Lord. His grandchildren love the Lord. Let me die the, the death of the righteous. And so anyway, we're going to celebrate later on. Our guest, Annie, is going to talk about just the shield of the mighty, and we're going to, it's going to be connected to this this thing as well. But I just want to say this, that that for the rest of my days, my respect for Glenn Smith Jr. is like maximum. Yeah. Maximum. And, uh, And guess what? I'm, I'm happy that I'm willing and we're willing to step out on the edge. How many of you know when we, when we don't pray bold prayers, yeah. 
and speak what we feel, speak what we sense we're sensing. We know in part, we prophesy in part. And when that which is perfect, which is the coming of Christ, then we'll see and we'll know even as we are known. I'm, I'm, I'm happy for the part we have. I'm happy for the prophetic. And so I've already, I've already lodged my complaint to the office. You know? Because some of y'all haven't been tithing and you've been naughty, and I would have traded you for Glenn. <laughs> that was just a joke. That's just a great thing for a first-time visitor. <laughs> wow, I'm not sure we should have gone there, Martha. <laughs> but the thing is, is that, is that uh, I'm excited about God, and we're going to celebrate. One of my nicknames for Glenn was Rockin' Glenn Smith. And uh, one of the highlights of his life was going back to New York to Danny's church with the band. And he, we always talked about the band tour in New York. And if Glenn... What could be here at his, you know, the day after he le left the earth, he'd be wanting to be up there either playing bass or drums or messing with the sound system where we're yelling stop. <laughs> but he would, he would celebrate. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to celebrate with all my heart, yeah. one, because of our Lord, but number two, because of our friend, Glenn Smith. Let's, let's stand up and let's worship the Lord with full strength. Amen. You ready to worship the Lord this morning?
Jesus, so oh, I'll never get, I'll never get, I'll never get enough of you. in this place. Lord, your presence is here. We worship you this morning. We thank you. To you forever reign, Lord. You are good. You are good. You are good. When there's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love, and display for all to see. You are light, you are light, when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope, you have covered all my sin. You are peace, you are peace, when my fear is crippling. You are true, you are true, even in my wandering. You are joy, you are joy, you're the reason that I sing. You are life, you are life, and your death has lost its sting.
to all know my dad passing on. Right now, my heart is in, in complete and total despair. Right now, my heart's in joy knowing that my dad is free from all the issues of this planet, that he's now entering into the greatest joy that we could ever experience. And right now, I can't let myself be beat by him. I have to continue moving on in joy because I know that's what he wants. He wants us all to be able to continue our lives. Even though he's not here, he wants us to still be trying our hardest to live in the joy and to live in the peace that God's had for us. And I, pray, and I felt that God wanted me to share this word with you all. Jesus, come on, let's just worship. I worship Jesus, this simple offering, it rises to you. Jesus, awesome redeemer, lover of my soul. Of our voice this morning to worship him. service, God. We're not finished worshiping. We're just taking a seal moment. And Lord, we're here today to hear your voice. We're here today to, to continue to interact with you. Lord, not for today, not for a service, but God, the rest of our lives. Lord, you are our God. You reign. You are beautiful. You are awesome. And we love you. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. You can be seated. God bless you. We're so glad you're here. If this is your first time, we just want to say welcome. This is a great house, a great family. And we just hope that you come back. Please visit us out at our info area, at our connections booth. <clears throat> that was a cool sound. I was kind of like, woo. <laughs> Felt like I should do some break dancing or something. But we're so, yeah, I don't think I'll try. But we're so glad you're here. We want to get information from you so we can stay in contact and get you a, a free gift. So thanks again for coming, Pastor Sean. Awesome. Thanks, Pastor Kim. All right, if we can have the ushers come forward, we're going to take up the tithes and offering. Turn with me to Matthew. We're going to be in chapter 6, verses 32 and 33. You know, out of all the things that Jesus taught, he taught a lot of money. And that may surprise some of you. But looking throughout the Scriptures, in fact, even in the issue of heaven and hell, he taught on money more than he taught on heaven and hell. In fact, he actually taught on money more than a lot of other subjects, minus, of course, the kingdom of God. Now, when it comes to Jesus' words... You know, and I think also of John chapter 12, verse 50, he came with authority in the things that he spoke. Listen to what it says here. It says, Jesus said, whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. So now, in Father God's heart and mind, why would he have his son come and speak on money so much? You know why? Because it's important to us. We all use finances, some 
we use it well. Others, maybe a little more poor. But the Lord is looking to, to get to the issues of a heart. In every spending decision, I've heard Pastor Steve mention this multiple times, every spending decision is a spiritual decision. Amen? Jesus also taught, though, that we're not to worry. And when it comes to worry in our lives, think of how much time that occupies our head when we fret and worry about the things of life. And yet Jesus promised that we're worth more than any of the birds. He'll clothe us, he'll feed us, he'll take care of us. In fact, I hear the birds singing up in that. I, right around this year, every year. I love it, it's great. But Jesus promised that our needs would be met. There's a quote that I want to read. It's from Robert Jones Burdett. He ministered in the late 1800s and says, There are two days in the week about which and upon which I never worry, yesterday and tomorrow. Amen? God wants us to point our direction towards Him and to give everything to Him and live in His righteousness. And what is righteousness? It's making the right decisions for the Lord. Hearing what, the, what Father God says is right and then doing it. That's righteousness. And when we do that, He promises to take care of our every need. Amen? Amen. Let's read these scriptures. Matthew 6, verse 32 and 33. And we're going to jump down to the second half of verse 32. But it said, Jesus said, Your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. All these things shall be added to you. Amen? When you give in the offering, do a heart check today and say, Are, am I worrying about things? Am I fretting about things? And here's what the Lord wants to say. Relax. Trust me. Trust me with your life and see that I won't take care of every single need that you have. Amen? Go ahead, ushers. Good morning. It's good to see everybody out this morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Allie. And I'm Thomas. And who had an awesome time here last night? Well, just so you know, we're coming back tonight for round three at 6 p.m. with Pastor Danny and Giselle. It's going to be an awesome time, so make sure to check that out. Bring every person that you see on your way. Just grab them by the hand. Throw them in your car. He said it was okay. It's going to be a great time. Awesome. And ladies, this Tuesday, May 7th, is our last Woo! WOW meeting for the year. So you guys, that means you have two days to grab as many women as you can find, throw them in your car if need be, and bring them here so we can pack out the house with women for our last WOW meeting. And youth, you don't have cars, but throw people in your mom's car for Outbreak. It's coming up May 18th at 6 p.m. The Armor Bears are hosting this outbreak. It's going to be a great time. If you're about to graduate high school, you need to be here to see what Armor Bears is about. It's going to be an awesome time. Again, we're going to have the best outbreak we've ever had. It's going to blow your mind. Make sure to come check that out. Saturday, May 18th at 6 p.m. here at Joy Christian Fellowship. Awesome. And May is already here, which means our golf tournament is in a few Woo! weeks. It's very soon. It's June 1st. So to register to golf, to sponsor, or to sign up for our awesome gala dinner, which is at a new location this year, you don't want to miss it. Check out the info, or the info booth in the main foyer. And that's it. That's all we have for your announcements today. We hope you have a great day. We'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. Thanks. That's all right. Get it all in. Father, we thank you so much for the givers in the house of God, and we pray a blessing upon these offerings, a blessing upon every individual and family who has given into your house. Lord, return to them. Lord, take care of their needs, and we thank you that you'll do that. We give these to you now in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Children's ch church is dismissed. What are they called? Children's, I almost said usher department is dismissed. No, we want them to stay around, please. That's right. And let's welcome up Pastor Steve. The Lord bless you. You're all looking so handsome and beautiful. No, go ahead and say, that's for me. No, I don't mean me. I mean you and the personal. Well, we've been having a great time. We started our three-day uh, mini-series last night with Pastor Danny and Giselle Bonilla. And we first met, uh, they were newlyweds about two years into their marriage and, and uh, living in Isabella, uh, Puerto Rico, and they're New Yorkans. So 
you know, Giselle taught me that when it's throwdown time that she's used to putting Vaseline on her face and pulling out her earrings. So if you see her take off her earrings and, and lube her face, just move on. That she's copping an attitude towards you. Just don't even stir it up because they're from New York. And, and if you've been to New York, it's very confronting. You can hardly buy a hot dog in New York without people, hey, hurry up. You, you park in here or you're going to buy a hot dog, you know. And uh, so anyway, but the connection years ago was in the spirit realm. It just seemed like every time we got together, we just we prayed together. We believed God. And so, so when I uh, went down to Sodom and Gomorrah and snatched me a wife out of the Bay Area of California and, uh, and brought her back to Oregon, uh, the four of us used to, used to pray at least one day a week, and we'd go buy donuts, and we would pray. And uh, there's a funny story. One time we went to the coast, and we rented a little, little uh, beach house. And so Giselle, is like a typical girl, she turns it up to a million. So if you want the heat to get to 70, you'd have to turn it up to a million. <laughs> well, we went to bed, and I woke up, and I'm sweat, and I go, and they overhear me going, oh, Kim, I feel like I, I, I'm in hell. I've died and I've gone to hell. That's my Pentecostal roots, the holiness roots, you know, you always, anything bad, I've died and gone to hell, you know, and, and so we, they still tell that story all over the world. But we found out it wasn't hell, it was just what Giselle can do, you know. And, uh, <laughs> but we began to pray about us planning a church here in Medford and them planning a church in New York City, and, and it's amazing do not despise the day of small beginnings because the Lord will work with your desires and he'll guide them into your prayers. And so they went to New York City. They raised up a church, a beautiful church uh, up in uh, Spanish Harlem. And then uh, now they're traveling internationally, especially heavily into the South American countries with a lot of sons and, and daughters in the Lord. And I don't know probably a couple hundred churches that they oversee. And, and God has just used that amazing, beautiful gift. So anyway, we just never fell out of love. We just have loved each other all these years. And so when, so when we picked him up at the airport, it was uh, 10 or so at night, and we got him over to their hotel, and guess what we did? We started praying. You just, you know, good habits die hard. We always hear bad habits die hard, but good ones do too. And so we just had a quick time of prayer, but that's the connection. Anyway, we just had an outrageous time last night. If you missed it, JCF Live on YouTube. All of our streaming services are on JCF Live uh, on YouTube. And so you can pick it up there. We had a great time, a lot of personal prophecy, great word. But I want you to welcome Danny and Giselle Bonilla with a great Southern Oregon welcome. <laughs> I love him. <laughs> I love Kim and Steve. They're precious, precious people. And you know what? When God establishes friendships, there's no man that could break them. And no matter how long it goes, and maybe we haven't been here in a few years, <laughs> but you pick up exactly where you left off. And to come back to the house and see Jacob and, oh, Jake, <laughs> and, and um, his daughter and his other sons, just worshiping the way they do is just so amazing because you see what's in your pastors be reproduced over and over and over again. The reason why they are worshipers is because they have parents who are worshipers. And I just want to leave you with Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, and God has been building this house for a long time. Every time that there was a wall that needed to be painted, maybe sometimes we felt uncomfortable and we went through the process. But the process is important to get to where we are today. And God is doing some awesome, awesome things, and the best is yet to come for this house. May the Lord bless you.
Thank you. That's awesome. Praise God. We are delighted to be here, especially on a Sunday morning, to see the church and what God has done in this place. Our dear friends, Steve and Kimmy, have always been in our heart. We travel around the world with them in our hearts. We tell stories about our youth and about our Bible college days and seeking God and how we birth the vision for what God would have us to do it was birth in prayer in each other's living room and how we spend time in God early in the morning hours praying and envisioning, dreaming about a church like this, dreaming together. We uh, would dream with them and they dreamed with us about Harlem, New York City, and how God, as we knew that God was calling us uh, to New York City, um, they prayed with us and believed God with us, and our dreams came tr through. True, uh, God uh, brought us through all the uh, uh, different circumstances of life, but we've seen our dream come true, and uh, we, we are standing in it. it comes, look at somebody and say, I'm living a dream. That's right. We are living a dream. I felt really at home yesterday when the service ended and then we had police cars with lights and uh, uh, yellow ribbons. I felt like I was back in New York. I, I'm back in Harlem. <laughs> I thought Steve ordered those just for me, just to make me feel welcome. Well, it's a great thing. We pastored a church for 22 years in New York City, then went out to Florida and uh, pioneered another work which we left with our children just about a few months ago, and uh, they are now taking over the work, uh, and it's great to see our children rise up in ministry, and they are God worshipers and serve the Lord in a tremendous uh, uh, way. I have eight grandchildren. Uh, I have a, a grandson who at the age of three, he is now 11, but at the age of three, he looked at me in the eyes and said, I'm going to be your successor. I said, that's a big word for you, Cyrus. And he said, well, uh, I said, do you know what that means? He says, yeah, I'm going to have your job. And uh, <laughs> he's been after my job for a long time. Uh, a while later, uh, I, got, I grew very ill in uh, uh, Bolivia while I was ministering in Bolivia. News came back to them that I wasn't going to make my flight, that I was in the hospital. All my grandkids were young of age. all started crying and to the Lord and interceding for my health. And they were all weeping in the living room. And Cyrus stood up and said, what's wrong with you? Grandpa's not going to die. I'm too young to take over this church. <laughs> so he's, he, he's set on his course. Uh, the other day we were honoring pastors and uh, we had this service and we asked all the pastor team to stand uh, and he stood up, you know, he's 11 years old, stood up uh, uh, to be honored with the pastor. He says, well, I'm going to be a pastor. I might as well start getting the honor now. <laughs> Well, he's believing God for a great destiny, and so are all my grandchildren. Uh, I'm delighted to see that it gets stronger and mightier in every generation. I believe it doubles in every generation. Uh, and to see uh, Steve and Kimmy's children now uh, with such an anointing. Can you give this family a big hand? Uh, they've raised the legacy. God is building a legacy for this house. Uh, it's taken years. It's a process. Uh, but the Lord has built a house. Uh, and it's wonderful that God uh, builds. And, uh, you know, we're still the same people, same simple people. We get together and we laugh. We pray. And uh, my wife is still messing with the thermostat. Uh, now is not to make it hot, but to make it cool. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's an age difference. Uh, uh, even when I travel, I have to go with extra clothes so that I can have at least two or three sets of clothes for every night when we go to bed so I can change in the middle of the night. It's hot, hot! And I'm changing my outfit so I can sleep on. Well, that's a, some of you get it later, but we're married 39 years, and it's been awesome to hang together and serve the Lord together. We have been together in everything we do. She's my best friend, my first disciple, my grand Hannah in the ministry. And um, I so thank God that, I, that we can travel together and serve the body of Christ. Our children have seen that, and today they are standing, believing God, that God will use them in their generations. So we thank the Lord for a legacy that has been built uh, by people who can stand and believe God no matter what comes our way. And and I so um, thank God that we could be here in this wonderful church. Well, I want to speak to you in light of the things that have happened overnight as we uh, uh, saw the passing of a great man of this house, uh, Glenn Smith, and uh, what's a gr great word from his son, is it Jeremy? Um, Jake? Uh, okay. To testify of uh, the passing of his father and the joy and the safety that he feels uh, and uh, security that's in this house. Well, it's an awesome thing 
uh, to be part of that and to pass that on to our children. I, I felt stirred in my spirit uh, with this message as I sought the Lord uh, to speak to you this morning about the shields of the mighty. I'm calling this message the shields of the mighty. Everybody say the shields of the mighty. I'd like you to start with me in Isaiah 61, verse 10. Isaiah 61, verse 10, the prophet Isaiah speaks of a day when the church would be decorated and uh, uh, would be adorned. And I'd like to just use that verse as a trampoline to speak to you about this. In Isaiah 61, verse 10, so I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, and my soul shall be joyful. This is Isaiah 61, verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, my soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. Anybody here clothed with garments of salvation? He has covered me. He has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. And I so enjoyed that definition of righteousness is making right choices, right decisions. He has clothed, covered me with a robe of righteousness and as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. As a bride adorns herself with her jewels and I believe prophetically, it was speaking of the Lord and his church, this bride adorned with her jewels. Uh, go with me to Songs of Solomon, uh, chapter 4, prophetically in this allegorical book that speaks about the church and points to the church of the end times. Uh, it is Solomon who's writing about the beauty of the church and the romance uh, of uh, the Lord with this woman, uh, the Shunammite woman. Uh, he writes of her in verse 4. Solomon, Songs of Solomon, verse 4, chapter 4, verse 4. Your neck is like the Tower of David. He's describing this beautiful woman. I believe he's describing the church of the end times. Your neck is like the Tower of of David, built for an armory on which hang a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. And he brings this to light that a church in the end times will be decorated by the shields of the mighty. That it will be the jewels that she will wear will be the shields of mighty, of mighty men. And it refers to it as the armory of David, the tower of David, built for an armory. And that word armory in the Hebrew actually is alpha, which speaks about, uh, it has a connotation to teach another generation, to mentor other warriors. Uh, it's an army built uh, for, so that warriors can be reproduced, uh, so that a legacy might be built uh, of men uh, of war. And uh, it says, your neck uh, is like the Tower of David. And you can just imagine him uh, describing this bride, a uh, beautiful woman that he is describing. Uh, the first few verses uh, of that chapter describe her teeth, describe her hair so beautiful. Uh, he talks about her uh, in a language that only can be understood if you understand uh, uh, that culture of that day. And now he brings uh, to light uh, the neck of this woman, uh, st a stoutly woman uh, whose jewels adorn her neck. Uh, and he says there, are on, they're like the shields of the mighty men uh, who hung uh, on the tower of David. All shields of the mighty. Would you say it with me? All, All shields of the mighty. The shields of the cowards did not hang uh, in the tower of David. It's very clear the shields of the weak did not hang in the towers of David. It was the shields of the mighty, the mighty men who had proven themselves in war. Men of war who had been loyal to King David had the right to hang their shields uh, in the armory of David. All shields of the mighty, making it very clear. And I believe uh, it was by tradition uh, that this was held up in every one of the generations of old. Ezekiel chapter 27 brings us a glimpse of understanding. You know, the Bible says in Psalm 119, verse 130, the exposition of your word brings light. The unfolding of your word brings light. It causes the simple to be made wise. So we go to Ezekiel chapter 27 and look for more light on this whole thing of the shields of the mighty. And listen to what it says. Shields of warrior, Ezekiel 27, verse 10 and 11. Those from Persia, Lydia, and Libya were in your army as men of war. They hung shield and helmet in you. They gave splendor to you. Can you say that with me? They gave splendor. 
They gave splendor to you, God said. Listen to verse 11. Men of Arvad, with your army, were on your walls all around. And the men of Gamad were in your towers. They hung their shields. Somebody say, they hung their shields. They had a a custom of hanging their shields when they were home for war, when they were watching, it was watchmen on the towers, they would hang their shields. They hung their shields on your walls all around. They made your beauty perfect. So God refers to the shields of these warriors, causing it to give splendor to a city and to give to make the beauty of a city perfect. They made your Beauty perfect. The shields that they hung around your walls made your beauty perfect. The tradition of hanging shields, the testimony that it brought to a city, these shields hung on a wall, said, gave word out to everyone in the city. There were hanging shields that added splendor and beauty to every shield. And I believe it's still that way today. I believe the shield of mighty men uh, uh, is still hanging. God is still, the eyes of the Lord are still looking for the mighty who will hang their shields in the house of God. I believe Glenn Smith's shield hangs in this house, having served loyally in this house. Can you say amen? But the testimony of shields was amazing. Uh, and it's, I believe it had a, 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 it was in four different areas that it testified. The shields hanging on a wall testified, first of all, to the king of that city. It said to him, uh, you are not alone. We are in alliance with you. We will fight for this vision. We will fight for this dream and for this city. So the king, it said, you're not alone. It's a shield of mighty men today. It still shouts out a testimony. Our pastor, our leader is not alone. We are standing with him. We'll be loyal to the end. It's the shields of the mighty. To the inhabitants of the city, it spoke uh, of security. As mothers walked the walls uh, and saw the shields of the mighty, and many of those shields marked uh, with markings that marked each tribe, each household. People knew the shields and what shields belong to each man. Even children could identify the shields of their father. And I can just imagine a mother walking in the city with her children and looking upon the walls where the shields hung all around and finding a, a comfort to say, we're safe in this place. There is security in this place. There are mighty men that are ready to fight for the security of this house. We can raise our children in this city. They will protect us. We are protected. Can you can you imagine uh, the little kids looking at their father's shield? Uh, maybe even uh, imagining and dreaming with their future. Someday, someday my shield will hang next to daddy's shield. Someday my shield will be displayed. Uh, I want to be just like daddy. Uh, I want my shield to be counted as a shield of a mighty man uh, of the city who protect this city. Can you give God an applause because the shields are still speaking? It also set out a word to any enemy and any foe that would dare to come and threaten the city. In those days, it would send envoys and messengers. Uh, sometimes these messengers would enter through the gates as they came uh, uh, to announce uh, what they were about to do. Uh, and war was yet not on. They would come uh, in a way of intimidation and they would march uh, through the gates of the city and have to walk right into the middle of corridor of that city with the heads of other kings, with the crowns uh, of other kings on their spears uh, to intimidate. And they would come to say either surrender or we will do to you as we've done to these kings. But one thing they had to contend with as they marched to the cities of God, they looked upon the walls and it, there was a message for them on the walls. It was the shields of the mighty that said there's an alliance in this house of mighty men if you touch one of us, you got to touch all of us. If you mess with one of us, you got to mess with all of us. We are connected and we will fight. We're ready to die for our city. If you come to threaten us, you better get ready. You better be ready for a fight because you picked the wrong city. Come on. I believe that's the kind of unity that needs to be found in the body of Christ. I was so blessed uh, that men ran uh, to the very last hours uh, of Glenn Smith. Uh, and I know you've been praying uh, for a long time and believing God with him. And God, you saw the favor of God lift him up uh, and give him some extra years. Uh, 
And Glenn himself prayed for people. I've heard of the testimonies on how people were healed because this man uh, held up his faith even though he was still sick. He believed God that God uh, would use him uh, in a mighty way. To see men uh, surround him yesterday, the mighty men of this house show up. Testifies of a unity in this house. Don't mess with us. We'll stand in the face of death. We'll stand together, united. We're the mighty of the house of the Lord. Can you give a hand to the mighty men of this house who have not surrendered? Who will not buckle under the intimidation of the enemy? And to God, it was a testimony of their loyalty. God, we are committed to what you've called us to do. We're committed to this city. We're committed to our families. We're committed to fight for not just our home, but the homes of everyone who dwells in this city. We will be loyal. It was a testimony of the shields of old. Today, if you still walk through the corridors of some of the castles that are in display in different nations, in England, Giselle and I had the privilege of walking through some of those castles, and as we walk through we noticed on the walls hanging were the shields of the noble men, the mighty warriors of those days who held up those cities, who held up that castle, who protected. They still stand as a testimony to the acts of mighty men of God. It was a tradition that it was carried on from ancient times to our days. Shields are an amazing instrument. Many have counted them as instrument of defense. Even riot police use shields today. And they have made up shields so that they can make their way into riots. But it's not just a shield to protect the warrior. It's a shield to advance the warrior. Because he gets to advance against the weapons of the enemy and advances forward, uh, getting close enough to eliminate the enemy. So shields were not just a defensive weapon, they were more of an offensive weapon. I think we need to change our understanding of war tactics. Uh, the shields uh, were not for you to cower and run uh, as you protected yourself with the shield. The shields were made so that you could actually get close enough for hand combat and destroy your enemy. Shields were made of different, uh, different materials. There were, at one occasion, they were made uh, out of wood and metal alike, uh, and, they, and they had an opening in them where they would actually put damp claws in them. And they would put moisture inside the shields with these claws uh, so that when the fiery arrows were shot, the moment they hit the wooden shield, they would immediately be diffused, uh, and would, the fire would be turned off, and the shields would not burn up. It was the tactic of war. There were shields that were made by armies that interlocked. And they were, became like a wall, like a tank moving through a war zone as they advanced with their shields interlocked with one another. Shields that were big and shields that were small. There were bucklers, shields for hand combat. And there were shields uh, that protected you and protected your brother. Well, I thank God uh, for men of God like Glenn Smith. And maybe today I'm, I'm just putting tribute and honor to a man of God who served this house. We had the privilege of having him in New York City. And I missed him for a day, maybe. I missed it by a day. But listen, I know he's in God, and I'll see him someday again. And I don't know if he'll be drumming or playing the bass in heaven, but he's going to be having a good time worshiping God. Can you say amen? I believe he's already doing it. Can you give God a big hand? Come on. The shields of the mighty. Maybe that's why Psalm, the psalmist wrote in Psalm 84. If you go with me to Psalm 84, verses 5 through 9, it says, Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on a pilgrimage as they pass through the valley of Baca, the valley of suffering or of tears. They make it a spring. Somebody say they. These are not valiant men who don't quit when there's tears and there's sorrow. They make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Somebody say from strength to strength. Look at somebody and prophesy this morning to them. God wants to take you from strength to strength. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. Oh Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O oh God of Jacob. 
Selah. And then verse 9 says, oh God, behold our shield. New King James puts it the best. Behold our shield. Looking upon, look, look upon our shields. And look upon the face of your anointed. Behold our shield. I believe that God, in the context of this scripture of a man going through hard times, through valleys, the psalmist was saying, I still have my shield. Lord, keep your eyes on my shield. Let, let your eyes be upon your anointed. Somebody say, I'm anointed. And that's right. You're anointed, and when God anoints you, you're anointed to the bones. How many of you know that? The anointing carries down to your very being. It abides. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, it says the anointing abides. The anointing that is in you abides in you. You have been anointed by the Holy Spirit. Can you say amen? How many remember Elijah dying and being buried and then somebody threw a dead man. Some soldiers were carrying a dead warrior, threw him in Elijah's tomb and when his body touched Elijah's bone, the man came alive, resurrected and ran behind his friends. Why? Because Elijah was anointed and when you're anointed, you're anointed to the bones. Sickness can't take away the anointing because that same chapter opens up saying Elijah was sick of a sickness of which he would die of. But that did not take away from his anointing. If you ask me about Glenn, he died an anointed man. Can you say amen? Come on. <coughs> they have authority to transform situations. The mighty. Oh, behold our shield and look upon the face of your anointed. Psalm 116 verse 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. It's precious. It's not a lack of victory for God. It's a great victory for the Lord. It's only a lack of victory when men flee and coward in the middle of a battle. But Glenn didn't cower. He fought with all he had to the very last moment. And Second Samuel has a testimony that brings a little bit more understanding also to the shields. Second Samuel chapter 1, verse 21 and 22 tells the story of Saul and how he died. And the lament that David picks up over this man who had turned him into a fugitive. This man who cast, uh, uh, tried to kill him many times, throwing spears at him, yet he understood that he was the anointed of the Lord. And he writes this, in the first chapter of 2 Samuel, verse 21. O mountains of Gilboa, this is where Saul met his end. Let there be no dew nor rain upon you, nor the fields of offering. For the shield of the mighty is cast away there. The message Bible says the shield of the mighty dragged through the mud there. The shield of Saul, not anointed with oil, from the blood of the slain from the fat of the mighty. Another translation says it never returned. The shield of the mighty was cast away there. The Bible tells the story of how Saul died fleeing from the Philistines. It was the archers as he ran from them. The archers met him. And he met his demise and perished. Perished as a man not waxing in battle yet David covers him by as the anointed of God. He says, the shield of the mighty is cast off. It was not anointed with oil. Anointed with oil is to be cleansed with oil from the fat of the battle, from the blood of the battle. The shield of the mighty. It didn't return back home. Because when the warriors returned back home, they had the custom to clean their shields and polish them with oil so that they could display them again on the wall. It was their testimony that needed to be upheld. That's why it says they hung their shields on your walls. After every battle, they would polish their shields with oil. And then after cleansing them, they would put them back up because they knew the value of the shields hanging on a wall. I want my family to see that I went to war, but I'm back. 
I'm alive. I might be injured. They might have had to help me clean my shield, but I'm here. Now, listen, men of war go to war, and they would rather die than turn back. Uh, and, uh, and They would rather die in their tracks than to turn back and flee. They don't back up from the enemy. They don't back up in a day of war. And uh, I thank God for men of God like Glenn and like many others in this house uh, who have been taught to fight like John Gomez uh, who fought a good battle. Can you say amen? Elders and leaders of this church and men uh, who suffered and, uh, and were on this platform serving as musicians and singers and God worshipers uh, who God has used and some of you are still alive. Uh, uh, listen, I'm, I'm igniting you again uh, that you might understand the value of your position in the house of God. You are a legacy builder. You're called to build a testimony for your children uh, that will bring security and safety so that some your, someday when, if you happen to pass your children can stand on this platform and say I feel secure I don't feel afraid I don't feel like I need to run uh, I'm secure in the house of God because uh, they knew he knew the conviction of his father I believe God's raising that kind of men today I believe that God is still looking for the shields of the mighty in our day. I believe that the Lord wants to cause shields to be polished in this house. You've been to war. Some of you have had a hard time in the last few months. Maybe the last few years even you've been tested. Your faith has been tested. You fought a few battles. Maybe you've been even wounded by the enemy. This is a good weekend to pull your shield and polish it. And to recognize that you're still alive in the middle of the house of God. That you're still here ready to worship. That you're still here when the enemy tried to take you out, he could not take you out. God by his might has preserved you. How many of you can give God a big uh, shout in this place of victory? I'm still alive. I'm still alive. Well, it's Ephesians 6, verse 16, that says, above all, taking the shield of faith. When it speaks about being dressed with the full armor of God, it says in verse 16 of Ephesians 6, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Paul, knowing something about shields that were able to quench the fire of fiery arrows, writes this for us while he's in chains. He's inspired to tell us how to stand in war. Above all. Somebody say above all. There's an emphasis on the shield of faith that's put in Ephesians that sometimes is overlooked. It talks about putting on the full armor of God, but then this verse 16 opens up with above all. Somebody say above all. Above. Taking the shield of faith. Your faith is your shield before God. Because our war is not against flesh and blood. Today it's not brandishing iron. It today is faith that rises in men of God who raise their shield of faith and are dressed for war, who know that their faith uh, can protect their families, their faith and their convictions uh, can protect uh, the house of the Lord and bring safety. In a day of great darkness, they can actually be those that protect the body of Christ. Uh, the church of the end times will not be a weak church, a uh, mangled church. A church of the end times will be decorated uh, with the jewels uh, of men of faith. Uh, the shields of the mighty shall decorate the house of God. Uh, and uh, everywhere there will be men, uh, heads of households uh, who have raised their shields and said, uh, we've been to war but my shield is polished. Uh, I'm ready for another fight. I'm ready for another battle. Bring it on. Make my day. Can you say amen? amen. Shields of faith and it will intimidate anybody who tries to intimidate the house of God. Shields of faith that sent a clear message. We're not weak in our faith and joy, Christian fellowship. We might lose a few warriors, uh, but we haven't lost the war. We're standing together. Our warriors have not fled. Uh, they have stood uh, and faced the enemy. Uh, their faith was standing. They held up their shield of faith, and with their last breath, they still believe that God could turn it around. Come on, if you're that kind of a man, uh, say amen. 
Where are the men and the mighty women of God? Uh, women of God uh, who have stood when men have abandoned them. Uh, they've taken up a shield when men have uh, loosed their shields of faith and walked away from their homes and walked away from their children. Thank God for single moms uh, that will take up the shield of faith and say, I will stand in the gap. I'll be like a Deborah. I will fight. Uh, Mothers who will dare to fight for their children. I like what Deborah said in her day. There was captivity and all kinds of shame and people could not walk the streets. There was not safety. The enemy was having his way until I, Deborah, a mother in Israel, she was a fighting mother, Rose. And they're fighting mothers, single mothers that need to be honored in this house. Uh, who have, men who have not stood their grounds and fled uh, at the sight uh, of the enemy. They've stood their ground, uh, protected their children and the legacy that God gave their children. Are there any single moms in this house? Where are they? Raise your hand. Come on, you've been a mother warrior. Stand up. Stand, stand in the house of God. We want to honor you today in the house of God. Give these women honor. Bless them in the name of Jesus. We, we honor you today. You stood and fought. You did not run. You ran towards God. You ran to the place of safety. God bless you for holding up your shield and protecting your children. Your children will be mighty. They will not follow suit of the cowards that ran off. Uh, they will follow the men of God uh, and the champions and to build on the legacy of great men of God. I believe there are champions sitting among us. I believe that Glenn, to his last hearing the testimonies, that he believed to the last moment that God could turn this thing around. He prayed for people and held his shield of faith. Not covering just himself, but covered other men in this house and prayed for them when they were destitute and had gotten a sentence of death. He believed and saw the turning around. People were touched. Or heard the story of a man that was healed as he prayed for them. Yet he perished, holding up his shield of faith. I'm reminded of a time I went through this with one elder that by... Reason of relationship, we called him Junior. His name was Conception, but that just didn't sound right. <laughs> Conception. So we call him Junior. And ever, he was the most loved elder in our church because he was a servant of all. He loved our community in Harlem, New York City. When he passed away, everybody told stories that we had not even heard strangers of the church who the ch were not even in our midst came and testified on how he met them on the streets and how he supplied for them and how he blessed them and how he served the community. They all testified of the faith of this man. Some of them getting saved when he passed. He had a battle with cancer for 10 years. God Gave him 10 years of life. He served every one of those days in the house of the Lord. Many times coming out of surgery in the next few days, as soon as he could get his strength to stand, he was in the house of God. And because he was into construction, he I would find him doing construction when the doctor said he had to be laid up for three weeks. A few days he was doing construction. I'd see him in his helmet. He could hardly stand hunched over because he had open heart surgery or something. Uh, and his body was still stitched up. They still hadn't removed his stitches and he was giving orders. Still, he worked so hard uh, by our side that everybody knew he was a faithful, loyal man. When it came time to die, his wife called and we all rushed to the house. My wife and I rushed there, got there before the ambulance. We went with the ambulance to the hospital. The doctors confirmed he's at his end. He only has a few hours to live. We called all the family and called all of our church leaders and everybody came with their children. Because he was so loved, the children were brought out of school hours and they came to the hospital and every one of them went by. And he was conscious. He could still hug them and kiss them. And they all hugged him and they all loved him and the nurses were crying and doctors were actually touched by this in a great way. Who is this man? Because he was so loved. A crowd of people making a line to hug him for the last few hours of his life. The doctor came in at the end of the line and said, you need to lay down. And they lined him down. It was very close to his death. He looked at me and said, Pastor, 
don't let me die lying down. Hold me up. I want to die standing. The Bible says after you've done everything, stand. Don't let me die lying down. We picked him up out of that deathbed. And we stood him, his wife, at one side and some of the elders with me. And we held him in our arms. And he took his last breath in our arms. We saw him pass as a man of honor. Having done everything, he stood. Oh, I spent years with him, discipling him. And maybe taught him some things about the kingdom and taught him how to live his life for God. But he taught me how to die that day. He taught me how to die standing. How to believe God to, with my last breath. So my heart goes out to you today. But I rejoice in the testimony of mighty men of this house who have stood their ground. They weren't perfect, but they stood their ground. And their shields will hang in this house. The shield of John Gomez can still be seen in this house. The shield of Glenn Smith is still and will be beheld by his children's children in this house. It will be a testimony to the leaders of this house. We've made an alliance with you. We will stand with you to the end of our life. No one will talk us out of our destiny and out of our dream. It tells the inhabitants of this church we're secure in this place. There's safety. There are, there's an alliance of mighty men that will give their lives for this dream and for this city. For the joy family is safe. It tells the enemy, don't you mess with us. Don't you touch our children. Don't you touch our families. If you touch one of us, you got to face all of us. We'll take a stand. We stand together. And it says to God, God, we will be loyal to dream until we stand before you. We are on a pilgrimage. We're the mighty. We go from strength to strength. We pass through the valley of the shadow of death. We pass through the valley of back of suffering. We'll cry, but we'll turn every one of those moments into victorious moments. We'll cause rain to come out of heaven because we're people of faith. We're different. We've been trained in the arts of war. We still hold up our shields. Are there mighty men in this place? I'm done. But God's not done looking at the shields. I think his eyes are still scanning the earth. It's like the book of Chronicles says. They run to and fro the earth. Looking for men who are loyal to him. That he might show himself strong. On their behalf. God's still looking for mighty men. So he can show off his strength. He's going to do it maybe. Even when your day is past. There will be another generation. That will take their shield. And hang it on the walls. Be ready for war. My word to you. Uh, first of all is to the men of this house. Are there men that will commit afresh to the kingdom of God and to the house of all faith and to this great thing that God has caused you to raise, your church. What Jesus said he would build. I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against her. If you are of those mighty men, I want to take this moment. This is for those in the house, committed to the house, would you rise to your feet? Men, the men, I'm talking to the men first of all, heads of household. Let me take it a little further. Because there is an alliance of faith that is made with men that stand together. I want to call you out of your seat to the front of this house. Come, come, don't, don't be shy. If you can make it, if you can leave your children with your wife for a moment, do it. Pastor Steve, come join me here. This is a great leader that God's given you. I'm his friend for years now. God gave me the privilege to meet your pastor. 
years ago. We hit it off and God locked our strength together. He's encouraged me. He's built me up just like he's built you up. He's an encourager, a builder up of men. And he's been a testimony of what a real man of God is. He's raised up a generation and a legacy that will go on even after God calls us home. I'm proud to be your friend, Steve. But your loyalties are to God and to a leader that God's called you to. If you do that, your children will stand strong. and They will be loyal to those that follow in their generation. I believe it's your shields that God's still looking at in this place. I believe while you're standing, the shield of men that have gone before you, like Glenn and, and John and others who have gone uh, before you are still hanging in this house as a testimony that they believed God all the years of their life. They didn't run in time of battle, but they knew that they were called to fight for a legacy. I'm calling you to fight for your children. Fight for your families. Fight for the destiny of your children's children by establishing a testimony of faith and hanging, polishing your shield with oil. Today's the day to polish your shields from the battle and the fat and the blood of the enemy and say, my shield is still ready. I'm, it's still hanging in this house and I'm ready to go for a next round. Amen? I'm ready to fight and I want everybody to see it. Would you touch a man standing by you and just as a connection in the name of Jesus. Let a hand be touched. Uh, let every man be linked as an alliance. Uh, and would you stretch your hands towards this man, your pastor, Pastor Steve, come right here. Grab the hand of this man here. I'm committed to my brother Steve. I don't see him, and it's been 20 years. I've seen him in conferences all through these 20 years, but I've not been back But I, to this house, to Bedford. It's been 20 years, but I'm committed as ever uh, to my friend and his destiny and to his children's children. I believe our children will walk together someday, change the face of the earth. Today, I want to lead you in a prayer of commitment. Lord Jesus, I want you to pray it out loud like men of war. Men of war don't whisper. They speak out. They have a voice. So say, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. it's in your precious name, your precious name. that we commit our lives to the dream that you've given us, to the leader that you've given us. We thank you for Pastor Steve. We thank you for every man that's taken an alliance in this house. Today we declare that we will polish our seals, put them on the walls of this house, display them for our children now. And for all who walk into this place, that they will know that they are those that would fight for the destiny of this house. We'll ready to surrender our lives for the future of our children and the future of our church. In the name of Jesus, we commit ourselves to each other. And to the dream of this house, to uphold a vision, and to raise a city of security, and of safety, where the enemy will not come in and have his way with our families, with our children, or with our children's children. To this end we commit before your eyes. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Can you give the mighty warriors of this house a big hand? Come on. But there are those. Now I'm calling the rest of the crew. The mighty women uh, who stand by these men. Uh, would you stand in your place and say, I'll stand with husband. Uh, we'll commit. We'll fight for our children. Uh, can the young uh, children and the olders of the house uh, can the young of this house and the youth of this house catch the vision uh, to understand that you are legacy builders. Uh, that you have been built. You've got a legacy that's been built by God. Would you stand and say I want my children to enjoy this legacy and make a commitment uh, to uphold the very truth the convictions uh, of truth of the word of God. Uh, let the house of the Lord stand today. Would you stand Stand with me. Let everyone in this house who's committed to the very work of God. This is 
This is for the valiant. This is for those who will not turn back. Only the shields of the mighty hang in the Tower of David. Today we celebrate you, your commitment, your faith. I'm honored to be among you. And to hear of the passing of a mighty man who served in this house and on your altars, whether it was on the drums, the bass, or keep the soundboard, whatever he did, he did unto the Lord. I leave with you your pastor. I believe that this is a mighty house and I'm honored to be with you this weekend. God bless you. I was down front just bawling. How many of you know it's, uh, it's a beautiful time? And uh, we didn't script this. I mean, what a blessing for, for Mary and the kids. And just an amazing just commemoration of what it means to, to war with the Lord. Thank you guys for, I just can see you in the spirit just polishing your shields. Just oiling them up. You know, a lot of times guys get discouraged and they, they don't go by where the mighty men gather. They go home and they put their shield behind the couch or somewhere. But I sense that we're going to run and say, man, it's a privilege. You know, Israel, sometimes they'd take whatever they could take. They'd take harvesting equipment. Go time's go time. You use what you have. And uh, anyway, uh, we're going to do a couple more things. So if you guys would um, <clears throat> grab your chair real quick. Sometimes when I hear a message like Danny just preached, I, I pray, oh God, someday could I preach? Could I preach a message? You're just stirred. And uh, Giselle was telling me that Danny has contemplated making this into a book. How many say, Danny, get that, put that in book form? That ranks up there. Definite challenger. Uh, what I would like to do right now is... Uh, we're going to just give everybody an opportunity. Let's stand up for just a second. Maybe, maybe you came in today and you didn't know why you showed up at church. You kind of felt like you needed to get your life together a bit. You thought maybe, maybe church won't be too bad. I know that, that if I was hopeless... Maybe the church would be the last thing that I would go to. But I think I would be completely in despair if I didn't feel that there was help from God. So people come week after week to God's house and they're saying, I need, I need help, Lord. I need help, Lord. And the Bible teaches that that help comes from the fact that you were created by Father. God created the heavens and the earth. He specifically made humans to house his spirit to be his family. From the fall on, every one of us have had to become born again. We've had to receive that forgiveness from the Lord. We've had to vote for God because God voted for us big time by sending Jesus in the middle of poverty, in the middle of occupation by the Romans, the Bible said that he was like a root out of dry ground. The Bible said if we'd look on Jesus, there was nothing about his physical appearance that would attract us. But yet this most splendid of all humans, literally God and man, the God-man Jesus Christ, lived perfectly, served the, follow, the, the uh, Father. And then his last act of obedience was to obey the Father by taking on all of our sins and was forsaken by God and all of heaven's wrath came against Jesus to pay for your sins and my sins. Any person that goes to hell goes to hell senselessly because the payment was paid in full. But it takes that ability to say, I can't defend what I've done. I can't defend what I've become, but I need a new life. The Bible tells us if we'll call on the name of the Lord, 
will be saved. If we call on the name of the Lord, he'll take away our shame. And right now I'm speaking not only to the local congregation, but to our online campus as well. And those that begin to hear about, about our streaming services and are peeking in to see about Christianity, it takes a call. It takes a handout saying, God, I need help. And I want every one of you that came here today looking for life change, come meet the Lord. Come meet the Father that loves you more than you could ever imagine. Step out of your chair real quickly and come down to one of these two couples. We want to pray with you. We don't do anything to embarrass you, but we believe that we have got to step out and say, Lord, I need help. Every one of you that came here for change, step out of your, your chair. Come on down. We want to pray with you really quickly. Come on now. There are folks here that God's working on your life, and the devil's trying to tell you, hey, hold on. Take some more time. Let me tell you what his plan is, to get you out and to hose you with all kinds of problems. How many of you know when the Lord calls, that's the time to say, yes, Lord, I hear, I respond. If you're here today and you and you have not joined God, step down and we want to pray with you. Okay? Right now we're going to pray together. And uh, if you're watching our streaming service or even if you see this on, on uh, JCF Live YouTube later, at any point, this prayer of faith, you can receive Jesus. Just let's all pray together. Dear Father, I thank you that you so love the world which included me, that you gave your only son, that, that whoever believes would not be destroyed, but would be saved. You said if I'd call on your name, you would save me. I'm calling on your name, Father. You said whoever would call on your name would not be ashamed. Take away my shame. Forgive me, Lord. Change me. Change my heart. Change my mind. Make me new on the inside. If you'll be my father, I'll be your child. If you'll be my God, I'll be your servant. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Salvation is just so beautiful. I just love to see when people come to the Lord. How many of you know we need to continually bring the lost people to God's house? They're not bummed out by Christians being Christians. They're only bummed out when Christians are not being Christians. That's called hypocrisy. Real Christianity is an attractant to people that are lost and need help. The last thing that we want to do is we want to sow into Pastor Danny and Giselle's ministry. I just want to say this, that sometimes we have guys who've got a local church that they're pastoring, and, uh, and so we always bless them with a good love offering. There are other times when you just flat see, that's good seed, that's good stuff. And uh, Danny and Giselle do a whole seminar that we want to bring them back and have them do the whole thing. But I wanted you guys to get a taste of their ministry. How many of you think you'd like Danny and Giselle back here? We... We want more of that anointing, more of that prophetic spirit, nature, and, 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 and the Word of God, which rules over the prophetic. How many of you know that whatever we do in the realm of the Spirit still has governing principles and rules? And so anyway, Danny and Giselle, they live off of the, their travel and, and the people who, like us, will sow into their ministry. Okay, today we're going to take a love offering. You can put on there Pastor Dan. You can put on guest. Okay, but what we're going to do is we're going to sow some seed and we're going to then take up an offering as well tonight. And so I believe that, that it's just so important that to the degree we feel that we're being changed, one of the ways that we offer thanks to the Lord is to bless that messenger whereby truth and freedom came. And so we're going to sow in and, and we're going to ask the Lord to just take care of our offerings today and tomorrow. Now watch this. If, if God is telling you not to give, don't disobey. 
keep your wallet in your pocket. If God is telling you to give, Kim and I have been on this upsweep where it seems like you know, we'll feel a number and then we go higher because we, we just feel like, Lord, we just want to keep ratcheting up this whole sowing and reaping. This has nothing to do with our tithing. Tithing is just giving back to God. But when we have an opportunity to give, we're saying, Lord, if we refresh others, we'll be refreshed. And so what happens is the thing that I would ask each person, each family to do is say, God, what are you saying? And I'll do that. The Lord may want you to give a sacrificial offering because there's been a, a blockage in that pipeline. You know, I should save this for when I have a need at the church, right? No. How many of you know that if we take care of, of traveling prophets and teachers that God sends us, he'll take care of our needs here. So I'm not afraid if the Lord puts something crazy in your mind and you give it. Hallelujah. But see, let's, how many of you say, I'll do what the Lord says? Because I'm not going to suggest numbers. The Holy Spirit will speak to you. Father, we pray a blessing upon this offering. Thank you for Pastor Danny and Giselle. Lord, thank you for your word. It was very healing to all of us, Lord. Bless this offering in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead, you, you all. Now tonight, we're going to be back at 6 o'clock. And we're going to... We're going to have a powerful time of praise and worship. And uh, we're just going to kick, kick out the walls. Today we had more of just a traditional uh, service. Tonight we'll probably be kind of crazy like we were last night. Amen. I want to say thank you to all you first-time visitors and all of you first-time viewers on the online stream. Bless you. Don't ever turn this dial off or your computer will explode. You'll go from an iMac back to a PC, old one. Hallelujah, we're going to have a good time.